Hello Booktube, uh, my name is Daniel, welcome back to my channel, Guilty Feet, I've got no rhythm. Uh, and today I'm going to revive a tag that went around before I joined um, Booktube. So about 18 months ago, Matthew from Maybury Book Club um, had this idea to look at his books in his collection just to see if he could possibly find something that he had read that Steve Donahue had not read. And so was born, uh, uh, the has um, Steve read this tag? Uh, and I watched a whole bunch of videos and Steve then very generously sort of did a response video to all the people who tried to find books um, uh, uh, in their, on their shelves he hadn't read and he responded and uh, I think in most cases he had read everything people thought he hadn't read uh, um, which if you have watched any of his output should not be a huge surprise. Uh, what I thought I would do is try and revive this or start season two of uh, Has Steve Donahue Read This and I encourage uh, other people also to try and find books on their shelves that he hasn't read. I think if you've even done the tag before, you can probably do it again and go back now that you know the, the, the things that you picked, even if you've scored two, three, four out of uh, uh, eight successes, uh, you might have a better chance now of of uh, uh, beating him. Uh, um, not that it's a contest, uh, uh, because why should he have read everything? I don't think he's ever claimed to have read everything, but I still would like to find eight books that I've read that he hasn't. A uh, couple of rules. So, eight books, first of all. Um, nothing too uh, crazy, obscure, not no computer manuals of the 1980s. Um, I also imposed a couple of rules on myself, which you, you uh, uh, may not appeal to everybody, which is I didn't uh, um, do eight books just of one genre. So, I've got a, a book on cricket here, and I know that Steve, he's mentioned that he's read some books on cricket, but I didn't pick eight obscure books on cricket um, because I thought that would be unfair. So that's that's one rule I've tried to, to vary it uh, and mix it up a little bit. Um, and then also just some, some general guidelines. Uh, um, I, you don't want to pick something that's sort of obviously too obscure or that, that just makes no sense and doesn't make uh, uh, the competition uh, fair or interesting. But the trick is also to find books that... that are neither so mainstream that he's obviously read it or so weirdly idiosyncratic that the chances are he's read that as well. So just an example of, of, of two extremes. Um, um, I, I would not pick um, my art scroll book about um, um, Kaddish, which is the uh, Jewish mourner's prayer, um, uh, which uh, has got lots of uh, explanations, translations of the Kaddish and, and the origins of the specific uh, Aramaic prayer that uh, um, is said uh, um, in the year following the loss of a close family member. So that would be too obscure. But similarly, I did not pick um, Kaddish by uh, Leon Xeltier because I think Xeltier is just well enough known uh, 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 um, that there's a chance that Steve has read this. So this, I think, would be unfair. And this, I think, even though I think it's a reasonably good shout, there's a chance that this is exactly the kind of thing that Steve Donahue would have read. So both of these were out. Uh, um, these are the eight books that are in. First up is my cricket book, and I have a bunch of cricket books, and I stuck to one. Uh, um, this is The Art of Captaincy by Mike Brearley. Mike Brearley was England cricket captain in the early 80s, famously during the uh, um, 81 Ashes series versus Australia, um, that is best known for Botham's uh, uh, sometimes known as Botham's Ashes, um, and the Headingley Test in 1981 was still one of the greatest games of cricket uh, uh, ever played over over uh, did they make it a five days I think so um, um, so really ne is, is not on anyone's list as the greatest cricketer of all time but he is uh, um, commonly understood to be one of the greatest tacticians and the greatest managers of um, sportsmen uh, ever uh, I think um, uh, after his, his sporting career was over, he retrained as a psychologist and has had a successful career uh, actually working and uh, uh, as a psychologist. So a great mind and a great manager of people. I, I found when I was looking at this that I actually have a signed edition. I don't know, is that, can anyone, does anyone know if that's actually Mike Brilly's signature? Because I, I bought this online. I don't think I, I bought it knowing it was a signed copy. So unless someone's gone through my books and sort of faked a Mike Brilly signature, this may be a signed. This isn't the original uh, edition. This was like a reprint a number of years uh, uh, later by Channel 4 Books at that time. Channel 4 had the rights to show cricket on TV, so they were doing, uh, they probably dug out sort of once popular cricketing uh, uh, books and, and republish them. So The Art of Captaincy by Mike Brilly. Have you read this, Steve Donahue? 
um, next up, uh, um, I want to be clear, I do not believe in the concept of guilty pleasure. This book was bought and read with no sense of irony. It was read for pleasure. Uh, um, uh, um, you may have noted that my uh, um, channel is uh, a pun uh, uh, based on a, a song, Careless Whisper, that was um, sung by George Michael uh, in America. I think it was released uh, under the name George Michael and Wham. This song is credited to George Michael and his partner in the band Wham, who was Andrew Ridgely. And this is Andrew Ridgely's book, Wham, George and Me. Uh, um, I bought this new in hardback and read it because um, I love George Michael and I love Wham. Um, and so does Andrew Ridgely. Um, this was written, I think, a year or two after uh, George Michael sadly passed away, tragically passed away um, too young. And this is Andrew's story. It's a sort of fairly standard nuts and bolts pop star um, um, autobiography. Um, I assume ghost written, does it say? No, I, don't know if it, I don't know if it's actually credited to a. Um, it doesn't say. Uh, so no reason for me to assume it is, but it, probably. And uh, um, this is just a wonderfully warm memoir of a friendship of two boys that started age 16, 17, were friends in school, and went on to become one of the biggest bands in the world, one of the first Western bands to play China, uh, number ones in the UK, number ones in America, um, uh, hugely successful uh, until 1986 when uh, the band split amicably. And uh, George went solo and had a, a, an even more um, stellar career as a solo artist, again, both in the UK and the US. Uh, um, and Andrew originally did very little after that. I think he released one solo album. He had a, a stalled career as a racing car driver and then pretty much in about 1987, 88, sort of retired. Uh, uh, but as one of the credited co-writers of Careless Whisper, um, I think uh, uh, life hasn't been... Uh, unnecessarily burdensome. Uh, I, I thought this was wonderful. Um, it's kind, it's loving. And uh, have you read this, Steve Donahue? Um, next up, again, this is not a, this is a genuine purchase that I bought, having heard good things about this. This uh, and this is the first in a series, and I've gone on to read the next four, and I'm waiting for the fifth one to come out in paperback. This is Hilda and the Troll. This is a graphic uh, a novel, relatively brief. Sort of, I don't know, it was a 40 pages or so. Uh, originally published as Hilda Folk, I believe. Um, there's now been a Netflix um, uh, animated TV series about Hilda. This is Hilda. She's a girl with blue hair in Norway, living uh, sort of outside the city near the mountains. And this is all about her adventures with trolls and giants and um, weird, invisible, tiny people. And uh, just absolutely fabulous. Uh, um, um, Every single one of these, every panel is a joy. Uh, um, the the uh, uh, art style is kind of quirky, um, but as I say, there are all sorts of strange. Let me see if I can find a nice splash. This is at night. This is the troll outside her bedroom window with the bell on the end of his nose, so you can hear him coming. Um, she gets into all sorts of scrapes. She has weird friends. She has a mum who wants her home in time for tea. Um, and uh, Hilda is just everything uh, you would ever want in a young uh, heroine. Uh, um, I, I think if you read this you'll enjoy her adventures just as much as I have done and continue to do uh, the question is have you read this Steve Donahue? next up is a book called Spinoza the Outcast Thinker uh, and this is a biography and a history of uh, Baruch Spinoza the uh, um, famous uh, Jewish philosopher uh, and uh, um, this is written by Devra Lehman who lives um um, about uh, um, just down the road uh, and uh, so Deborah has been a, a guest in this house Deborah and her, her marvellous family uh, uh, have been guests here and uh, um, uh, I bought this book because this was the first uh, book that she published Deborah was my kids English teacher so both my boys uh, um, studied with her after school so outside school you know, they, my, my kids are bilingual so the school is in Hebrew when they learn English in school it's it's they're native English speakers, so they're not taught in the same as the as the non-native English speakers. But uh, uh, often, when we're not alone in expats in in providing uh, or getting doing extra 
um, curricula um, English with uh, an outside teacher and Deborah was that teacher and she's responsible for I think any love that my children have of, of reading um, I think they read Pride and Prejudice when they were um, in Deborah's class and they wrote poetry and did all sorts of amazing things and she was probably the best teacher um, um, they had uh, and uh, and this is her book and uh, it's a fine piece of work in its own right uh, and I question whether Steve Donahue has read it um, okay that was my top four and I front loaded it because I'm confident ish with those four uh, and if I've lost you know if, I, if I'm not at four for four right now then I'm in big trouble because the back four I think there's a good chance he will have read one two three maybe even four of these um so if i'm already in trouble it's it's game over but if i'm if i'm three or four out of four then there's a good chance we'll uh, we'll pick up another one um this is another piece of non-fiction this is an evil cradling by brian keenan brian keenan was uh, held hostage in uh, lebanon in from about 87 to the early 90s um and this is the story, the book that he wrote um, after he was released. Uh, um, he was held for, for a lot of the time that he was in captivity. He was shared a cell with a man named John McCarthy. And uh, um, John McCarthy, uh, uh, at the time, his partner was a woman called Jill Morell. And they wrote a book after John McCarthy was, was released. There's another book called Some Other Rainbow by John McCarthy and Jill Morell. And they have alternating chapters where he talks about his a time in captivity and his relationship his friendship with Brian Keenan and she writes about um, in London and and um, working uh, um, with her, her friends and her, the community in London trying to keep the story alive so that the politicians would keep fighting to try and get um, these men released um, so my wife and I were very invested in this story because we're, we're students in the early 90s as they're, as they're released you know in the build up to getting them released and then uh, at the time they were released so we read that story, first of all, the Some Other Rainbow. I don't know where my copy is of that. Um, and it's hard for me to file because it's got two authors. It's, it's John McCarthy and Jill Morell. I think my in-laws have it. Uh, um, but this was the book that uh, Brian Keenan put out. Uh, John McCarthy was a big part of this book because, as I say, they were in a cell together, I think often chained to radiators on either side of the room. Um, and this is a wonderfully humane... It's not a bitter work. Uh, Brian Keenan is a, uh, from Northern Ireland originally. He was a teacher. He was teaching in, in Beirut when he was kidnapped and, and captured. Uh, but I, I just remember this as a tremendously wise, gentle, human look um, at, at his captors, at his friend, John McCarthy, who, whom he went through this traumatic and terrible ordeal with. Um, and uh, but I wonder whether this is right. I don't know if this is even in print anymore. It was a huge book at its time in the UK. I don't know if this would have got to America. And so I question: Has Steve Donahue read this? Um, next is a collection of journalism. I know, I know, Steve. This is the kind of thing Steve would read. But this is a, a very modern collection, uh, and this is the first collection I have by um, Charlie Brooker. Um, who was uh, at the time? Yeah, uh, I'm going to sneeze. Bugger. Uh, was was the TV um, reviewer for the Guardian. To these days, he's well known as a, an Emmy award-winning writer, uh, a creator of Black Mirror. Um, so that, if you're wondering where you heard the name Charlie Brooker, uh, it's from that he created and write, wrote, I think, every episode of Black Mirror, and he's won at least one Emmy, I believe, for uh, his work on that. Um, before he did that, um, he has a, had a TV show in the UK called um, Newswipe, or a Screen Wipe, where he um, um, talks about the news and how it's presented and um, the sort of hypocrisies and, and quirks of TV news. And before that, he was a... Um, a TV reviewer for the the Guardian. These uh, um, reviews are full of the most vicious and hilarious snark. He's just got a fabulous um, um, turn of phrase. He's a genius for finding the bon mot, and uh, and this is really really sharp writing. Um, I think it's hard to sustain um, um, uh, week in week out uh, reviews of television which is often easy to ridicule British television, whether it's soap operas or silly game shows, and he, he talks about them all. It would be hard to sustain if it was all snark 24-7. And, of course, the, the genius of, of, of not just Charlie Brooker, but 
the great reviewers know that if you're going to do snark and if you're going to rely on uh, um, being snide, you also have to temper that with a generosity and a willingness uh, um, to acknowledge when things work. You can be as mean and as and as uh, vicious uh, um, about things which are rubbish only if you are open-hearted enough to uh, understand and acknowledge when things really are great and he does just enough of that i think he's got a great sensibility he's got a really terrific voice and this is just a collection of his his um, television reviews i've got three more volumes uh, um, and i can dip in and out of these this is it starts in early 2000 and just the kind of shows he's talking about there's a thing of top gear real sex on channel five emmerdale news round just he, he wrote about everything um and he has a really really great voice uh charlie brooker's screen burn have you read this steve donahue uh, now we're really getting into dodgy territory this is an australian novel um adult book by malcolm knox um knox was a, a um i think a cricket correspondent or a literary co correspondent as uh, a journalist working in australia and this is um a fictional novel that he wrote which has um, got a test cricketer at the heart of it whose father's passed away and there's some mystery going on and it's it's um it quite i haven't read a lot of australian literature uh, i wonder if, if scott and Nell have uh, uh, come across malcolm Co knox at all um but i enjoyed this partly because of the cricket element partly because it's sort of um uh, got a mystery to it i wonder if this got to america oh, yeah, it was published in america it was published as a private man so just to be clear if you haven't read it it's not possible that uh, um if he has read this is not as as adult book it might be a private man by malcolm knox so apologies for, for any confusion but have you read this steve donahue and the last book I'm going to choose is really the rockiest ground of all. Um, another English author, uh, but this was a prize-winning book, and, and there's even now a prize named after the late author. I just question whether this reached America, how widely read uh, um, this author uh, um, is or was in America. But it, it, this this may be the face palm moment. Uh, um, uh, Steve Von Hewitt said in every every list of eight that he's received, um, you know, some books he's read, some he hasn't. He says in every single one, there's one book with the, that he cannot believe someone has asked him if he's read it. And why this may be that book, we'll see. This is, uh, uh, the book is Al McCogan. The author is Gordon Byrne. Um, uh, Byrne died uh, um, at age 61, tragically young. Um, and there is now a Gordon Byrne Prize given every year for um, um, books that most embody the spirit of Gordon Byrne. This was his first novel, um, and it, it's called Alma Cogan. This is Alma Cogan. Alma Cogan was a real person. She was a pop star in Britain um, from the mid-50s through to the mid-60s. Um, by the end of the 50s, she was kind of already falling out of fashion. So she she was known as the girl with the giggle in her voice. So she she was a real personality and a real star in the early days of television. Um, but was already um, kind of going out of fashion by the time the, uh, uh, the Beatles arrive on the scene in 1962 uh, um, and become TV stars in those early days in the UK. And uh, But uh, despite the fact that she was already towards the, the end of her career, I think she becomes friends with, with McCartney and there are rumours that she was more than friends with, with John Lennon. Um, so she was really of the old school, but this kind of this handing over there's a there's a lovely clip on on youtube of john lennon introducing her um on one of those tv um, um music shows of the of the sort of 1963-4 area uh by the mid 60s um, she tragically died of cancer dead at 34 i believe um the starting point of this novel called alma cogan um it narrated by alma cogan um uh, because the starting point is that she didn't die and this is narrated by Alma Cogan in her um, uh, 60s, I believe, reflecting on her long career in in show business, which is a very daring conceit to take a real character uh, who died uh, um, and may not be terribly well remembered. I don't think many people in England will remember Alma Cogan unless they're of a certain age, for, certainly before my time. I kind of knew of her, but no, no one was playing her music. Um, she had one, you know, there, were, there were a few sort of novelty songs. She got a song, you can never do a tango with an Eskimo. It's that kind of sort of novelty before 
music got serious again in the 60s. Um, so the conceit of taking somebody who not, may not be well remembered and writing a book in her voice as an older woman looking back on her career is one um, sort of uh, um, uh, unusual conceit. Um, the other person is, so this is Alma Cogan in, the, in this sort of Warhol-esque um, um, picture. This woman here is Myra Hindley. Uh, for those who don't know, Myra Hindley is one part of the Moore's murderers with her partner Ian Brady, responsible for some of the most heinous crimes ever committed in uh, um, the 20th century. Uh, they kidnapped young boys, tortured them and killed them. Um, uh, in many cases, buried the bodies and it was years before uh, the uh, families of the victims ever got closure or found out where the bodies were buried. Um, Hindley and, and Brady were eventually captured and Hindley died in, in prison. Um, this is a weird uh, a juxtaposition of these two um, historical women. Uh, um, that wholly worked for me and I, I don't want to spoil anything or say anything about what happens. This book builds to a climax which is stunning and shocking and uh, the confidence of a first-time novelist to pull something like this off um, was breathtaking to me. Um, Alma Cogan by Gordon Byrne, I don't know how well this is remembered or, or read today, but this was a, a terrific uh, a book yeah, um, for me. Uh, and I question whether Steve Donahue has read this. Those are my eight books. Do I think I've got a chance of getting more than three or four? Dare I hope for five? Who knows? Uh, but I encourage everyone to do this because I just think it, it's a fun way to look at your books and see how everyone... I, I think a book collection is like a fingerprint. It is probably unique um, to the reader. And so uh, um, I like this, this way of having to look at my books and seeing how this is modelled around my life and my reading career over the last 30 years. Um, and, uh, and let's hold that up and see how untrue that is and all our fingerprints are just some fingerprints of Steve Donahue's who knows let's see uh, I encourage everyone to, to to do this and let's see if we can start season two uh, and uh, um, and if you've done it already you could do it again probably and uh, and that's your lot take care bye